Are you working in a nonprofit, but having to work extra jobs just to make ends meet? Do you want to make a difference in the world, but are completely burnt out from overwork and underpayment? Do you wish you could leverage your passions to change the world, but on your own terms, having the flexibility to travel and make the money you are looking to make? This is the Humanitarian Entrepreneur Podcast. We are building a network of global activists and empowering you to have the freedom to have a thriving business, making an impact in the world without burnout. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Humanitarian Entrepreneur Podcast. My guest today is Nell Edgington. She has spent her 25-year career innovating in the social change sector. As president of Social Velocity, she helps create more strategic, financially savvy, and confident nonprofit and philanthropic leaders about and organizations. Nell is a popular writer, speaker, and blogger, and author of Reinventing Social Change, Embrace Abundance to Create a Healthier and More Equitable World. Nell holds an MBA from the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. Nell, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me, Tiffany. So as I was telling you before, I was first introduced to your book last summer by another consultant. And I, I really have been raving about this ever since. So I'm <laughs> so, so excited to have you on. Um, this is one of the books, um, those books that you, I think that everyone within the NGO, nonprofit, social change sector space should read. And um, I'll get to one of the big reasons why I love this book so much in a minute. But I am curious as to what called you to write this book. Well, I had been sort of half writing a book for um, probably the last 10 years, um, but it never really gelled for me until um, right right before the pandemic, honestly, it was about November of 2019. And I suddenly just kind of had this inspiration or this framework of how to sort of bring it all together. And so I sat down in about eight weeks and wrote the book. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) That's awesome. So one of the reasons um, why I love your book so much is because you actually talk about how it's um, not us that's broken, but the system. This is one of the first times I've ever seen anyone talk about the origins of the social change movement and how that's just perpetuated and being undervalued in this field. So can you talk a little bit more about the book and um, and specifically about these origins so that people understand and you know just... Um, really that perpetuation of just this, this um, mindset of being undervalued in charity and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I refer to it as the scarcity mindset. There is just such a omnipresent view of lack in the nonprofit and philanthropic sector, right? There's not enough money. There's not enough time, not enough board members, not enough power or influence, et cetera. And that comes from, I believe the historic origins of the sector. So our modern day nonprofit and philanthropic sector came from the benevolent movements of the 19th and and 20th century, where women, you know, the only public role they could have would be to work in charity. And so that sector, the charity sector was kept very separate from the private sector. The charity sector was funded by sort of the, the pennies thrown to it from the male dominated private sector and government sector. And that largely is true today, right? Um, and so that that pattern um, has, has really stuck. And it's created this, as I said, omnipresent view of there's just not enough. But that's that's just a mindset. That's just a broken system. And we can break free from that. And, and if we do so, we can create so much more social change. Absolutely. So why should we stop approaching social change as a charity? And how do we release ourselves from this broken system and you know, reclaim our power? So we have to stop thinking of um, the work that we do as just a nice to have, as you know, we're just we're just doing good work, we're just making do with what we have, we're just applying a band-aid to you know much larger problems. And instead, really view it as what it is, which is creating social change. It is um, creating justice where there is injustice, creating equity where there's inequity, right? It's it's really trying to heal our relationships with, with each other and with our planet. 
And so if you think about it in that much bigger way, which it, it honestly is, that is the work that we are doing as social change leaders, and you start to recognize and realize that charity and pennies just aren't going to cut it anymore. We really have to get serious about the level of investment, the whether uh, the amount of value that we place on the work that's happening there. It, it all just needs to, to undergo a, a real shift. Absolutely. So how do we do that? And how do we break free of this? I mean, I guess this is um, just continuing on about the scarcity mindset that, you know, but that we have to do it all ourselves and and not ask for help because that's, I, I see that so, so often um, because a lot of the times it's, it's women in these fields and it's just indoctrinated into us that we just, we have to do it all. And, you know, like there's just this idea that, we have to do everything and we have to do everything ourselves. So how do we break free from that? Yeah. So I think as with any change, it's got to start with the individual. It's got to start with, with you. And so when you recognize, Hey, this doesn't work anymore. I'm burned out. I'm exhausted. I'm operating under a broken system. In that very act, you start to search for something better, something different, something new. And so to me, that's where this shift starts. And I, I say in the book, change yourself, change the system, change the world. If you can start with recognizing where you yourself are operating under a scarcity mindset and start to call BS on that, then you can really start to move towards abundance. And what I have seen time and time again is you move towards abundance, your staff, your board, your partners, your funders all start to sort of follow in your footsteps and real transformation can happen. So how do we start to recognize that though? Because I think that I hear so often that it's like, I'm just so bogged down with all this stuff and they, there's just like not a moment to breathe. You're just constantly in reaction because this is, I mean, again, this is kind of, I think where you're going to go, but you know, when you're constantly in reaction to everything that's happening, because there's just so many fires that you're going to put out and you're trying to do it yourself. So how do you really, you know, recognize when you're being burned out and exhausted and, you know, where, where to kind of go for, because when you're just, you're in the trenches and you're just treading water, you're trying to catch a breath, but like, you know, what do you do? Where do you go? For me, one of the things that I think can be really helpful is the word yet. It can often provide a bridge from that, just again, that omnipresent scarcity mindset. So just as you are articulating, right? I'm constantly putting fires out. There's not enough people. There's not enough time. It's all up to me. Those are all scarcity beliefs. But you can take any one of those and attach the word yet to it. And that opens up an opportunity to move into something else. So you can say, there's not enough money yet. My board isn't helping me at all yet. Or my funders just don't understand what it is that we need yet. And by doing that, it, it causes your brain to sort of open the door to, oh, okay, well, what are some other possibilities out there? What it starts to just sort of move down the list of, okay, well, maybe I could ask for help or maybe I could go talk to my board or, you know, maybe I could start to articulate this to funders differently or maybe I could go, um, you know, get some advice from peers or other uh, experts in the field. You know, it's just that the possibilities are out there and they're endless, but you have to allow yourself um, the possibility. You have to open that door and say, okay, maybe there's something better than what I'm currently experiencing. Absolutely. And so to go off that, what are other possibilities? You talk about the importance of community and networks in the book. And so what do you feel is the best way to cultivate community connection and support? So I think the first step is to say, it's not up, all up to me. I think so often in the nonprofit sector, nonprofit leaders are under this delusion. And again, it's, it's not their fault. It's because of this broken system that they've you know, inherited. But they're under this delusion that it's got to be all up to me. Um, you know, just as an example, the, the nonprofit sector doesn't invest very much in professional development or coaching, um, you know, or those sorts of things that there's just sort of a, a ethos that you shouldn't ask for help. You should be this superhero that can just do it all. Well, you have to call BS on that and start to stand up and say, it can't just be up to me. There's got to be more. And so the way you start to build your network is to start to look around you and see 
who are the other folks working in this space? Who are the experts that have insight into it? Um, you know, who, who else has an interest in it? Who's funding it? Just sort of map that landscape and then start to reach out to those folks and simply reach out to them to say, hey, you know what? I've realized I can't do this alone. I would love to just brainstorm with you. What hurdles are you finding? Where could, could I be helpful to you? How could we share some of this together? Just initiating those conversations can be absolutely transformative because then others start to see, hey, I'm not alone either. And maybe we can sort of join forces and start to move some of this um, forward together. Absolutely. So then how do we get people to recognize and, and people, I should say, the system, <laughs> the people that make up the system, that the importance of, you know, that professional development and all of these things that are lacking in the private sector versus the public sector? How do we navigate that? Yeah. So, so again, I go back to my, my mantra from my book, which is change yourself, change the system, change the world. So you've got to start with yourself, right? And so, I, you know, I, I, I often say I wrote this book, you know, you write the book you needed to read. So this is an ongoing struggle for me as well, right? How can I, uh, when I feel scarcity thoughts coming in, how can I reach out to others? How can I ask for more help? How can I move more and more towards abundance? So it's that continual going back. When you see something out there in the world that's, you know, oh, they're not investing enough in professional development or, you know, the system is broken in this way. In, in your own little sphere, make a difference. So you as an organization start start investing in professional development, stop asking for permission to do so. Start, you know, talking to your own partners about, hey, here's how we're doing things differently, just in case you're interested. Change whatever you have influence over in your own little world and start to see the ripples happen. Start to see that system change, start to see people invest and, and do things differently. I think that that's so, so important because I think there's a lot of this asking permission and it's, it's really moving beyond that and investing in yourself, exactly what you're saying. I think that's so, 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 so important. And I think that um, people really, really need to hear that and and not just hear it, but actually apply it into their life. Absolutely. (laughs) Because I just, (laughs) this is why I'm like, everybody needs to read this book. (laughs) Is there anything else that we need to do to really move past this mindset of, I know we talked about scarcity, but, and even lack, but what about competition too? How do we move past that? Yeah. So, you know, competition is such an interesting concept, right? Because it, again, baked into it is this idea of lack, right? This idea of scarcity. So, and so often, you know, it's like a feeding frenzy with nonprofits and funders, right? Oh my gosh, there's just, there's such a limited amount of money and, you know, we need to go after it. And, oh no, what if our competitors get it? And, and I, I get that. I, I see again, where those beliefs come from. Again, they come from this, this ethos that we've inherited, but you can instead say, you know what, there is so much money out there. And, and again, just as a couple of data points, over the course of the pandemic, billionaires got significantly richer and you know, the government just sort of out of thin air created you know, billions and billions of dollars in aid for COVID relief, right? So money is out there. Tons and tons of money is out there. So this belief that, oh, there's just a tiny little pie and we as nonprofits have to compete for it, but it's wrong. It's just a lie. And so if you start to kind of see things in a, in a different, more abundant way, you can stop feeling like you have to compete with your peers and instead start to really collaborate with them, network with them, ask them for help, really open yourself to all that, that is out there for you. Mm-hmm. Like, what are the other possibilities? How can I get this in a different way? And exactly. yeah, going back to that co- collaboration thing. So how do we stop resisting money? Because I mean, that's a real thing, even though people don't always like to think they're like, oh, no, no, no. You know, I, I, I don't resist money, but yet, you know, it's, it's, there's that, still that focus on lack and competition. So how do we stop resisting it and really understanding what resisting really is? 
Yeah. So resisting money can take so many forms. It can, it can look like fear. It can look like disparaging it. You know, I can't tell you how many times in boardrooms I have heard board members and staff, you know, say, say very disparaging things about money, right? You know, oh, it's, it's just so much work. It's so hard to get it to come in the door. We're just out of ideas, right? But instead, and I know this sounds crazy, but if instead you think of money as a friend, as an ally, as, as really just energy, benevolent energy that wants to move towards anyone that, you know, wants to invite it in. If you can start to think of it that way, then you can start to talk about money differently. You can start not fearing it, not pushing it away, not agonizing over it. You know, all of those times that nonprofit leaders spend, you know, waking up in the middle of the night, you know, terrified about how am I going to make payroll and, you know, how am I going to make more money come in the door? Every time you do those things, you are pushing money away. And so if you can start to move to a place where, and just sort of catch yourself, even in the moment, when you're talking to a board member, or you're talking to a friend, and you're, again, you're sort of disparaging money, flip the script and start to think again, maybe using the word yet, what are the possibilities around money? What are the positives around money? And start to see that shift happen for you as well. Uh, yeah. And you know, I just, I, so many times I get those that are still in the nonprofit space that are not getting it. And they're like, no, you don't understand. Like you don't get it. You don't get my life. You don't get, you know, this, 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 and that. No, 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 you don't get it. And you don't get it until you get it. And it's really trying to shift your, your, your mindset from that scarcity and to thinking differently because what's been working or what hasn't been working for you isn't going to work for you in the future. So you've got to be talking about money differently. You've got to be thinking about money differently. Absolutely. If you want different outcomes, right? You've got right. to act differently. So you've got something has to shift. And for me, it's it's the mindset is, is so powerful when you shift your own mindset. That's the good news, right? Yeah. Like you don't need something external to change. You don't need suddenly a massive amount of foundations to open their doors, right? You don't need that. All you need to do is shift your own internal mindset. And again, I know that sounds bonkers, but I it see it's too time easy. Time. I know. Well, it isn't yeah. easy though. It isn't right. easy. And I will tell you that from personal experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> again, yeah. you know, I every single day I will I wrote this book, but every single day I still will have a moment of scarcity thinking. And I'll catch myself and I'll say, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> scarcity thinking, let's shift that. So it's work. I'm not going to lie to you. It's not easy. But the point is you have the power to do it already inside you. I think the other um, aspect to that though, that you brought up about fear. And I think that um, that's also this, because I've, I've seen this so, so much. And it's not so much with nonprofit workers, because I mean, I can tell you, I, when I was in that world um, as an employee, I just remember always being told, you're never going to make money in this. That's not why you got into this. And if you're going to make money, you've got to go and you got to work for like the government and you've got to get a pension. And that, at that level is where I see so much fear when I talk to people who, I mean, people who are absolutely miserable, but they fear losing their pension. And there's just so much fear around that. They just don't know how to move past that. So how do you look at fear, deal with fear so that you can move past it and, you know, really create the change that you want to do in this world. Yeah. So, you know, fear is very real. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. And you can't, you can't just, you know, look fear in the eye and say, be gone. <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that, that really, that is not going to work <laughs> right. because fear is pernicious and it's going to hold on so tight, but fear is, is at the end of the day, fear is your, your amygdala right? You're the fear brain, uh, the part of your brain that, that operates fear, right? It's the fight, flight, or freeze that we, you know, uh, came up with as we developed as, as human beings. And it serves a very real purpose, absolutely, right? To keep us safe and, um, you know, here still in our physical bodies and all of that good stuff. But there are so many times in our modern world where that fear is just getting in the way, this sort of constant anxiety and, and all of that. And so I think absolutely we have to recognize that there are times when we can't deal with the fear our, ourselves. Um, 
But the good news is there's all kinds of help out there. So, you know, um, therapy, emotional freedom technique, which I'm a huge proponent of, you know, all sorts of things that can help you move beyond that fear and start to let it go. But the point is, I think you have to look in the mirror and say, I'm tired of living with this fear. It is holding me back. I'm miserable and I want to move beyond it, but I need help to be able to do so because I can't do it alone. Right. And that alone can be fearful of actually admitting that, you know, I can't do it alone. And especially, I think this is huge for men. I mean, just admitting that because there's this mindset for men that, you know, you have to do it all as well and you can't show weakness. And when you're, especially when you're talking about therapy and all all of these things, it's just, it's like, this is just like one of those strange things of how, how how do I navigate that? But what is the best way to leverage our resources, our teams and our networks to create that lasting social change in the world? To me, it's, doing everything from a mindset of abundance. And so again, the work is, you know, to, to get yourself to a place of abundance. Um, And I talk with my nonprofit clients about this all the time, you know, start, start where you are, start with yourself and, and, and work to move yourself towards abundance and then go into your boardroom, go into that meeting with a funder, go into that networking with a partner in that space of abundance. And I even have um, some tricks that I give my clients to to do to go do something that you love doing right before you're going to go meet with a funder. Um, So I have a a client that loves to hike. So I'm like, you know, go for an hour long hike, come back, clean up real quick, and then go (laughs) meet with your funder, right? Because you're going to be in such a better space. Your head is going to be in abundance. And that is just going to translate to the conversation you have, to you know the energy they bring into the room, ultimately to the check that they write, you know all of that. So in every um, stage, move through the world in that space of abundance, and you will begin to move your own networks, your own funders, your own board members, your own staff towards that as well. Well, that's just fantastic. And thank you so much for writing this book. I mean, this is just, again, the the link will be in the show notes along with all of your contact information for you as a consultant and all of that. I know that we've talked a lot about your book. Do you want to talk about um, the work that you do as a consultant with these um, nonprofit organizations? Yeah, absolutely. So I work one-on-one with um, nonprofit and philanthropic leaders. And it's really, you know, doing this work, helping them navigate. Because as I said, you know, the shift from scarcity to abundance, because as I said, it's, it's hard work, right? Right. It's really hard. And so, um, you know, people reach out to me to say, you know, how do I do this? How do I start to see abundance for myself? And then how do I translate that to, to my organization uh, and the work that I do? That's fantastic. Now, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me, Tiffany. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Humanitarian Entrepreneur Podcast. To stay up to date and receive free, valuable resources and action guides, you can find us at humanitarian-entrepreneur.com.